Welcome to the demo of Winyard's Gun Crime Intelligence Tool. I'm going to be demonstrating how our intelligence tool could be used to simplify, strengthen, and expedite a typical gun crime investigation. To do so, I'll be working with the tool in the same way that an analyst or an investigator might, with the goal of apprehending trigger pullers, identifying networks, and preventing future crime. So I'm going to dive right into our fictitious scenario here and start with the recovery of a firearm from a recent shooting where police were called to the scene of the crime. I can search for virtually any piece of information across my entire data set by typing it into the entity search bar up here. I happen to know the serial number of the gun that I'm looking for, so I could type that in. If I happen to only know a few characters, I can type that in as well and have Intel do the rest of the work for me. This is the one I'm looking for, so I clicked on it to drop it into the graph. So this icon here represents a particular gun as it's mentioned in several uploaded files across the entire data source. I can see the relation to each of these instances by right-clicking to bring up the navigation wheel and then clicking through to expand to see the types of relationships that I can choose from. I can also see what exists under each of these relationship types in my right reading pane over here. Here I see the actual entity, or document in this case, that referenced the gun. So back to the story here, an abandoned gun is recovered from the scene of the crime, no witness or suspects yet, so the first step for police would be to initiate an e-trace and a Niven ballistics request for the weapon. Once the e-trace is returned, it's loaded into Intel. So this is our e-trace response form. I can see all the information contained in this form by checking through to my properties tab. This is great for picking up quick one-liners like the dealer and purchaser, but to avoid having to read through all these larger text sections, I can pull these to the graph as well. This would allow for easier navigation between each of the major subcomponents of that document. Given that we have no witnesses or other persons of interest yet, it would be wise to start with the gun purchaser Erica Crevier, I can pull her to the graph to check out a statement she made to detectives who interviewed her. By double clicking on this document here, I can dive right into the contents so they as they would have originally appeared in a simple Word doc that Intel ingested. By clicking on the Extracted Entities button down here, I can see all the bits of information that Intel has extracted using layered algorithms for complex text mining. It's picked out names, dates, places, and other objects of interest. These few categories are not an exhaustive list, as you're going to see in other entities graph later that fall under other data categories. The most important piece of information for an investigator at this point might be found in the last sentence of her statement here. It indicates that she was buying from an individual named Michael Greeno. I can call Greeno4 by right-clicking on the name and then dropping him into the current graph that I'm working in. You can see that he was brought through right here. I could also accomplish the same thing by expanding all the individuals connected to Erica by any document where both names are cited. Because Greeno is probably our best lead at this point, I want to find out if we have any other pieces of information about him in my current data set that's going to help with this investigation. So here we see two other instances of Greeno, which are actually phone and banking records. They appear as red because they're a different entity type. The orange represents instances of Greeno extracted from unstructured text, like a Word document, while the red represents individuals extracted from structured data sets, like phone records. I'm going to check out his phone records first to corroborate his relationship with Erica. I can search specifically for her in the call log, or I can bring all the data right to the graph. I'm going to right click and select outgoing calls first. I can also limit the amount of information that's going to be brought back to the graph by using the query function to create parameters around date, time, recipient, frequency, etc. Since I'm not sure where to look first, I want to bring all the information to the graph, but I do want to see who act the actual owners of each of these different phone calls are. So I can look individually at each record. I can see that this one belongs to a Sael Martinez, but I do want to see all of them together. So I'm going to bring that information to the graph as well. So now, of course, things get a little bit more interesting as more data populates my graph. But at this point, I might need help knowing where to look next. I can use my filter function up top here to choose a filter that will help me narrow down only the most important information. So you can see as I slide the strength filter slowly across, some items and relationships that are of lesser importance to me right now are going to fade away from the graph. Probably one of the first changes we see, though, is back at this point. 
where we see two things of interest right now. One, we can see that Erica was indeed in communication with Greeno, as she mentioned in a previous document. But two, and probably more importantly, is that Jessica Lutz, who's been referenced in the same document near Erica, has also been in com contact with Greeno. We wouldn't have thought to look through these phone records specifically for calls between these two, but now at this point it might be more interesting to us. If the graph is starting to look a little bit crowded, but we don't want to lose the initial mapping we did, I can go through to the History tab and revert the graph back to a specific action point. I'm going to continue investigating Greeno by checking out banking data next. I want to move this section to a new graph, and I can accomplish this by clicking the To New Graph option. I still have access to my original graph and can actually toggle between the two of them down here. In the same way that I expanded the phone records, I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing for the banking data. So now I can view details about each of these individually again by looking at the Properties tab. But I think I'm actually going to use this banking data a little bit differently here and use the locational data associated with all the transactions by viewing this information plotted on a map. Now I can use the simple transaction record to tell me where he's been lately and even how often he's frequented certain areas. I can see here that there's some heat mapping around New York City, which indicates his usual geographic location, but I can also see some anomalous transactions over here in Cranford, New Jersey. If I hover over each pin, I can see that we have three different withdrawals for $500 each in the same area that Erica and Jessica are located. So now Michael is looking even more interesting. At this point, he's displaying behavior similar to larger arms dealers rather than the trigger puller we're after in the short term. So we obtain a search warrant to search his property uh, for the possible leads on who he's doing business with. So now I've called to the screen a full accounting of all items recovered from the raid, which includes several weapons as suspected. I do want to see if we know any other information about each of these items over here. So I'm going to check for those specifically by only selecting the items in this area. I'm going to hit the shift key, select just this little bit square, right click, expand, linked. So now right away we see a link between one of the guns and the same serial number that was extracted from the E-Trace report. As it turns out, the specific gun was mentioned in the report as being one that was bought at the same time as the original weapon that we recovered. This lends further credence to the idea that Greeno purchased both weapons from Erica. So while Greeno's pursued for further questioning, we're going to take a look at the results from the Niven request that was put in. So right away I can see that this has some matching evidence. I'm going to take a look at that. So apparently the gun was positively linked to a cartridge casing recovered from an earlier date. At this point we have a gun from an open investigation tied to another case that might share a common trigger puller. I'm going to now pull all the information related to the original case in hopes of finding some clues. So the first thing I want to look at is the incident report from the scene where the casing was recovered. It appears to still be an open case, but the highlights are that it seems to be a homicide of an individual named Stuart Michael Fitzpatrick. I'm curious about the timeline of events and how it relates to my current investigation, so I'm going to open up the timeline feature, which can actually be opened up in either the document viewer page or in the spider graph page. And the timeline is going to plot occurrences of different entity types across the calendar of events. It can even pick up details from all of your data across all cases if you'd like to see how two seemingly unrelated investigations may actually sync in ways we didn't think to look at by manually sifting through timestamps on case reports. It seems as though there were some suspects identified at the time of investigation, but at that point in time there wasn't enough information to convict anybody. Because these suspects also might represent some of the people I want to be looking at for my current case based on the Nyman connection, I'm going to take a second look. So now I've pulled all the pieces of intel that we have related to each of these individuals, including case notes, informant reports, and some phone records. 
So for this one in particular, rather than repeat the same spidergraph extension for individuals' phone records as I did for Greeno, I'm an employee shortcut here by checking out all the entities listed under each relationship. Here are all my individual calls for outbound communication. And towards the bottom here, I can see who he's linked to, the inbound communication, and probably most importantly here, we can see that he's linked by case to Mr. Michael Greeno. Now, if I was new to this investigation, that might not mean anything to me yet. So I do want to bring that information to the graph. And now at this point, we see that one suspect in particular, Michael Johnson, stands out above the rest because we see that he's been in communication with the now known dealer of the very weapon that was used in both the murder of Michael Fitzpatrick and the open case of our in initial recovered firearm. I hope that this case helped to illustrate how intel can be used to focus investigations, reduce resource expenditure, and uncover valuable links previously undetected by routine investigations. Thank you.